بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك وعلى أهل بيتك المظلومين صلى الله عليك وعلى ابنتك المظلوم فاطمة الزهراء سيدتي نساء العالمين صلى الله عليك يا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي فنفوز فوزا عظيما Illuminate your hearts and majalis with a loud salawat for Muhammad and Al Muhammad. <clears throat> Respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. When it comes to the topic of our children and raising our children, the Holy Quran makes two important points. Number one, the Quran shows us that our children are one of the greatest blessings that Allah could ever give us. The Holy Quran says, المال والبنون زينة الحياة الدنيا That our children are the zina. They beautify our lives. Without children, our lives would be so boring, would be so bo dull and mundane. So it is the children that make life exciting and they give beauty to our life. So this is the first point that the Quran mentions. But then again, the Quran says that at the same time that our children are the source of our pride and they are the adornment and beauty of this life, our children are also a fitna, the Quran says. The Quran says, إِنَّمَا أَمْوَالُكُمْ وَأَوْلَادُكُمْ fitna." When we think about fitna, the last thing that would come on our minds is our children, correct? Fitna, I think something is evil. By the way, fitna means test, trial. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses fitna in the Quran to mean test and trial. So Allah is telling us that yes, children are beautiful, you enjoy them, they make life very exciting, they add flavor, but at the same time, when I give you children, there is responsibility with it. It's an amana, it's a trust. So that's why Allah Azza wa Jal considers it as a fitna. Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam heard one day someone saying, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-fitna. Oh Allah, I don't want any fitna in my life. So the Imam told him that I see that what I am hearing is basically that you don't want any children, correct? He said, what? What do you mean? You said I don't want fitna. The Imam told them even your children are your fitna. Allah will test you through your children. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us this blessing, this zina, this ni'mah, but at the same time, he tests us through our children. Meaning, will I carry out my responsibilities towards my children or not? Will I teach them what they need to live a comfortable life in the dunya and in the akhira or not? Many parents, they understand the first part. Raise your child to be successful in the dunya. Give them what they need in the dunya. But unfortunately, we forget about their akhira. They have another life which is the Akhirah, which is the true life that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us for. Do I raise my child to be successful for the Akhirah, for the next life, or is it just the dunya? This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests parents when it comes with their children. Some parents, they're so happy as long as their children are healthy and they are getting good education. Alhamdulillah. But what about their iman? What about their faith? That's not important. If my child prays or not, if my daughter wears hijab or not, you know, that's completely up to her this is not my business it's not your business if she wears hijab and prays but it is your business if she doesn't want to get an education how does that make sense either you let go of everything she wants to live a life without education he wants to live a life that he doesn't care about his health we would not allow that when it comes to the dunya but when it comes to the akhirah surprisingly some parents have a hands-off 
policy. So this is where the fitna of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes into play. And the Quran is trying to show us that no matter how religious and devout you, the parents, may be, there is no guarantee that your children will also follow in the same way. There is no guarantee that my children will also be religious. And the greatest testimony to that is that we have stories in the Quran of prophets of Allah, messengers of Allah that struggled with their own children, that struggled, struggled with their sons, with their daughters. And they were prophets of Allah. They were messengers of Allah Azza wa Jal. And Allah shows us three stories of this in the Quran. Number one, the story of Prophet Adam. Adam was a prophet and he was a messenger. And we've all heard what happened to his son Qabil, correct? Qabil, who is the son of a messenger, became a criminal. He became a criminal who was envious of his brother and he killed him because of that envy. So just because my father is good, just because my father is a prophet, does not mean that I necessarily will become good. Number two, the second example is Ya'qub alayhi salam, the prophet Ya'qub. And we've read the story of what the sons of Ya'qub did to their brother Yusuf. The crime they committed against Yusuf once again because of envy. They tried to kill him. They threw him in the well. And then they repented at the end. So even though my father could be a prophet, my brother could be a prophet. But yet, unfortunately, the individual may become misguided and devious. And the third example, which is the greatest example that Allah gives of a undutiful, ungrateful son, is the son of Nuh, Prophet Nuh, one of the greatest prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His son was condemned by Allah in the Quran, where Allah tells Nuh, Oh Nuh, this is not even your son. Yes, biologically he's your son. But realistically, he's not even your son. Let him go. And he drowned and was condemned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why does Allah tell us these stories? Bedtime stories so that you can fall asleep? Obviously not. Allah wants to send a lesson. You are religious. You are spiritual. You are faithful. There is no guarantee that your children will be religious. So what do I do? That's it? I leave them? No. The Quran is trying to show us and motivate us to be extra careful. And you see the three examples of the Quran, the sons of those prophets. All of that happened at a time where there was no internet. There was no social media. And there wasn't this liberal wave that we see today. So if you imagine, if you see that those prophets struggled with their sons and their sons struggled with religiosity, you can imagine what a challenge the youth, our children face today in 2022. Now it's much more difficult, brothers and sisters, to hang on to your faith. Number one, because religion is facing a setback every single day. Religion, as I speak, is in decline. There was an article in the New York Times a couple of months ago that said, do you know what the fastest growing religion on earth is today? <laughs> Try to guess. It's not Islam, no. It is not Christianity. It is not Judaism. It is not Buddhism. It is not Hinduism. What's the fastest growing religion in the world today? Ahsantum. The fastest growing religion on earth today is non-religiosity. Non-religiosity is growing, it's spreading like wildfire. And they cited a Pew Research study that said 40% of millennials of today, which are people in their 20s and 30s, which I, by the way, am also a millennial. 40% of millennials today identify themselves as being non-religious, meaning either an atheist, or agnostic or just non-religious in general. 40%. And every year, it's becoming worse and worse. Maybe in 10 years, in 20 years, in 30 years, it will be 70 and 80%. You see the times that we live in? Our children are raised in a time where 40% of millennials, they don't like religion anymore. They're not interested in religion anymore. What is happening, brothers and sisters, in our communities? When you come to the masajid, when you come to the Islamic centers, everywhere, you don't find too many youth. But go to the cafes, go to the sahras, and you see hundreds, you see thousands of youth going 
going there individually and in groups all of this showing you that our youth are no longer interested in religion because of all the challenges they face so religion is at a decline and morality is at a decline these are the two things that give us immunity religion and morality religion from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the more moral system the values that we have morality is at a decline once upon a time 50 60 years ago a youth growing up anywhere in the world, especially here, would know what's right and wrong, what's moral and immoral, correct? If they wanted to choose the wrong path, they knew it's wrong, but yet they wanted to choose it. Today, our youth don't even know what's right and wrong anymore because morality keeps shifting. What was unacceptable, immoral, disgraceful 50 years ago is now perfectly acceptable. And you know what I'm talking about. Look at homosexuality. Just a few years ago, 30, 40 years ago, it was shunned in this country. Now you can't say anything against it. And a youth who grows up in this country is taught that this is fine. Nothing wrong with it. This is completely moral. It's not, it's not about people doing it or not. It's about others who normalize it and see it as completely moral. Nothing wrong with it. And this has also become old now. The new trend is the gender movement, correct? They tell you that you wake up one day, you feel like a boy, you're a boy. The next day you feel like a girl, you're a girl. The third day you're not a boy nor a girl. You can start creating new pronouns for yourselves. One day I'm a he, one day I'm a she, the other day I'm a it. Remember once a brother told me I met a young person. And uh, I met, I met a, an American individual. I was at an event and I asked him about his daughter. I asked him, how is she doing? So he told me to not call her she anymore because she decided to change her gender. Call her it. How is, I don't know, it doing anymore? Subhanallah. And they normalize this. And this is just the challenge and difficulty of today. You can imagine five years, ten years down the line, the new t challenges that arise. That our youth don't even know. They don't understand what's right and wrong anymore. So religion is at decline and morality is likewise at a decline and that's why the holy quran has a very clear message for us if we are parents or inshallah we shall be parents one day the quran says ya amanu, anfusakum wa ahlikum. oh you who believe protect yourself and protect your family protect your children from these challenges protect them from this wave of liberal liberalism immorality and non-religiosity because if you do not you do not work hard and you do not struggle and you do not put all the time and effort into this, your children will be swept in this liberal wave. 100% my child will be swept. And today, 2022, it's no longer possible to shield your children from hearing about this. You may say, you know what? I hope my child never even knows about these new immoral things that happen to our in our communities and societies this my friends is a failed tactic because you can no longer shield unless you're living in a cave you can no longer shield your children from this why because now this immorality has invaded our homes once upon a time if you wanted to see immorality you would have to seek it you'd have to go after it now my friends it has invaded our own homes how through the internet, through the smartphones, through the iPads that our babies now, two years old, we buy iPads for them, correct, don't we? Three years old, they have iPads. Ten years old, they have a phone. Social media, YouTube, internet, we don't know what's in these, correct? And that's why you find that these phones, my friends, social media and the internet, they have a greater influence on our children than we as parents. They raise our children more than we do. How do the ch children learn what to do and what to say and what's right and wrong? It's from people they follow on social media. It's from their friends that they, that they connect with on social media. This has a greater influence and in shaping the personality of our children than we as parents. So you cannot keep them from being exposed to this. But what you can do at a young age instill the values of islam instill the values of ahlul bayt so they have that inner immunity so that even if they are exposed they know what's right and wrong because they have been taught 
what's right and wrong at a young age. And that's why when you look at Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam and his relationship with Fatima alayhi salam, the Prophet never took this for granted. I am Rasulullah. I'm the best person Allah created. Uh, my daughter is obviously going to be religious. No, because Rasulullah knows that there were prophets before him. Their children, they were lost. So even prophets have to be careful. If prophets have to be vigilant, you can imagine what you and I should do. That's why Rasulullah had a very special relationship with Fatima. He raised her very diligently. Rasulullah was very careful to focus on Fatima such that he raises her to be a great individual. So when you hear Fatima alayhi salam is Sayyida to Nisa al Alameen, she is the greatest woman of all time. Don't think that happened spontaneously, just naturally. Oh, yeah, because Rasulullah was the father. No, it was because the hard work and effort of Rasulullah. So that's why tonight, inshallah, I want to mention a few lessons that Rasulullah taught Fatima and we can also learn at a young age. Number one, the first lesson that Rasulullah teaches Fatima alayhi salam that we can find in the traditions is that he taught her prayer, the importance of prayer at a young age. Prayer, my friends, is very important when it comes to raising our children. Almost every young individual I know struggles with their salah. Salah is just a burden. It's just too difficult. When you think about it, how long does salah take you? 20 minutes. 17 rak'ahs, correct? 17 wajib rak'ahs. Each rak'ah takes us one minute. Allah is not asking much from you, 20 minutes. But yet everyone I know at their young age struggles with their salah. Why? Number one, because we as parents do not instill the importance of salah with our children at that young age. Once they're 15, once they're 20, Yalla Baba, come and pray. Yalla Mama, let's pray together. Correct? That's too late. Ahlul Bayt tell us that when your child is seven, that they have to pray every day. Make it a habit since they're seven. Why? Because if there was any errors, any mistakes, they're still young. Allah Azza wa Jal will exempt them. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala will excuse them. So start at the age of seven, teaching them salah and the importance of salah. And you don't just tell them; you have to be the role model. When it's salah time, it's maghrib and isha time. You pray jama'ah in your house. This is a habit that should be in every single house. Every time I pray salat al-maghrib and isha. I call all my children and pray jama'ah. You don't have to have a sayyid, a shaykh, a maulana, correct? To lead the salah. You can lead the salah, the father, in the house with your family. So instead of leaving your son, your daughter in the room, just playing video games and on social media and only Allah knows what they're doing, call them every day. At least salat al-maghrib isha. Dhuhr and asr, you're busy, they're busy. But Maghrib and Isha, every single day, I pray Jama'ah. From a young age, I instill the importance of Salah. That this is something that they grow up with. And you know, when a child grows up with a habit, usually it continues. Versus when they're older, they're teenagers, they're more reluctant to accept new habits in their lives. And don't just teach them Salah, teach them the importance of Salah. Your salah, you tell your dear son, your dear daughter, is your connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your salah is the way that you thank Allah azza wa jal. Look at all the beauties that Allah gave us, all the na'am, all the benefactions, all the favors that he showers us with. How do we thank Allah azza wa jal? You thank him through salah. So you teach them the importance, the significance of salah, and teach them to understand the wording of salah. Many youth, they pray. They don't even know what they're saying. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah rabbil al-Ala. They don't know what they're saying. Subhana rabbi al-Ala. Of course it's going to be a boring salah that they don't connect with. So we have to teach them the meanings of what we recite in salah. In this way, salah will become more important in their eyes. Fatima alayhi salam is raised from a young age to not miss salah. She comes to Rasulullah, the hadith says, and she asks him, my dear father, مَا لِمَنْ تَهَاوَنَ بِصَلَاتِهِ مِنَ النِّسَاءِ وَالرَّجَالِ What happens to someone who doesn't care about his salah? What happens to someone that takes his salah lightly, doesn't take his or her salah seriously? Fatima at a young age is asking her father. What happens to the one that does not take his salah seriously? 
And this is where Rasulullah teaches her. He teaches her the beauty of Salah. The benefits of Salah. Why I should be praying every day. And the Prophet shows her that Salah has an impact and an effect on every part of your life. For example, the Prophet says, number one, the individual who does not pray or does not take their Salah seriously, Allah will remove the Barakah from their Rizq. What does this mean? Rizq, my friends, is anything good you have in your life. Money, anytime you receive money, this is rizq. A good spouse, this is rizq. Good children, this is rizq. If you have good health, this is rizq. Good mental health, we need this right now in the pandemic, right? This is all rizq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some people, they just ask Allah for sustenance and rizq, and that's it. This is not enough, the Prophet says. Rizq, sustenance by itself, will not make you happy. Sustenance by itself is not what you should ask for. You should always ask for barakah, blessings in your rizq. Why? Because if there is blessings in your rizq, two things will happen. Number one, if there is blessings, barakah in your rizq, the rizq will come much easier. The rizq, the sustenance will come much easier. You see, sometimes you work so hard, so long, and you don't really make anything. Other times, you work so little, but you see the reward is so huge. Those instances, there is blessing. There is barakah in that rizq. You don't want a huge rizq if it's very difficult and it's, it's really, you know, you have to stay up so many nights and it, it's torture for you. You don't want the rizq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to come in a difficult way. We want rizq to come easy. Likewise with marriage. I know some young individuals for years they try to get married they cannot find the girl that they want to get married for years five six years they try once twice five they're struggling with their rizq finally in the end they may find their future spouse but after so much trouble after so much anxiety and stress there is no barakah there is no blessings in the rizq ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to place the blessings in the rizq. So when there is blessings in your rizq, it easily comes. And not only does it easily come, it doesn't easily go. Sometimes you make good money, but it goes, it's wasted on things that you didn't want to spend on. I remember once there was a brother who told me, Sayyid, one day I made $700. This was a huge day for me. He's a young guy, correct? The beginning of his career. He said, the next day I get into a car accident and I have to pay $700 to fix my car. What's the point of making $700, but next day you have to spend it to fix your car? There's no point in that. You have to ask Allah to give you barakah in your rizq, meaning that you benefit from it. And it's, it's there and it stays. And that's why they say the word barakah stems from the word barakal ibl. The Arabs, when the, they used to have a, a saying that when the camel sits, they used to call this barakal ibl. Meaning that the camel is sitting and when the camel sits, it won't get up, it sits for like a day or a day or two, it will rest. So barakah is something that's permanent, it's there to stay. So ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the barakah in your rizq. This is number one, when there is barakah in your rizq, it easily comes but it does not easily go. Number two, when there is barakah blessings in your rizq, Allah will allow you to enjoy the rizq that you have. Meaning that many times, money, my friends, becomes the source of misery of some people. Life was good. When that money came, it destroyed their lives. I mentioned the story a couple of weeks ago, if you were here Thursday night. I mentioned the story of a couple in the UK who won the lottery. Five million pounds, seven million dollars, correct? This money became the source of their misery. Why? Because it started creating problems in the family. And the wife wasn't caring for the husband anymore, created jealousy, tension, it escalated until the husband wanted to kill his wife one day. This was in the news, I read it last month. He wanted to kill her, stabbed her seven times with the knife in her face. She didn't die, but as I speak, she's in the hospital. And the husband is in the prison. What's the point of winning five million pounds, seven million dollars, if it's going to lead to this outcome, correct? Do you want such money? So don't just ask for money. Ask Allah to place barakah so that you can enjoy it. I know many instances of a family that was destroyed because of money. 
they were happy, they were fine, the husband and wife were all good. But because they became wealthy and the business started to get better, this created so many problems and it led to divorce. I know instances of a husband and wife that have such a messy divorce because there is money involved in it, right? Because the wife wants to take half of the money, the husband doesn't want to give her, and then he hires a lawyer and she hires a lawyer and they spend hundreds of thousands of dollars just on that case. Who's happy? The wife is not happy. The husband is not happy. Only the lawyers are happy just making, milking the you know the the husband and wife and i know instances stories of brothers and sisters who got along very well but then there was inheritance their father died and there was a huge inheritance and because they disagreed on how to distribute the inheritance the the relationship of the brothers and sisters was completely broken so don't just ask for rizq brothers and sisters ask for allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow you to enjoy the rizq the sustenance that Allah Azza wa gives you. And finally, sometimes rizq, Allah can give you something, can give you money, and that money will lead your iman to become weak. What's the point of rizq if Allah gives me money, and that money causes me to go away from Allah Azza wa Jal? So ask Allah Azza wa Jal to give you blessings in your rizq, meaning it will make me happy, it will easily come, it will not easily go, it will make me happy, and it will keep me a believer, a mu'min, believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Rasulullah is teaching Fatima. He tells you whoever does not take their salah seriously, Allah will take away the blessings, the barakah from their rizq. So pray and Allah will add the blessings in your rizq. This is number one. Number two, the Prophet tells her, Ya Fatima, the one who does not pray, does not take their salah seriously, then their dua will not be raised to Allah Azza wa Jal. See, sometimes we pray, we have a hajah, we have this very important thing that we want. We pray and pray and pray and ask Allah Azza wa Jal. But Allah does not grant us our hajah. Why? The Prophet says that if you are not taking your salah seriously, then your dua will not even reach Allah for Him to answer you, for Him to grant you what you need. Why is that? It's because if you want Allah to give you your haja, there has to be a line of communication between you and Allah. Correct? If there is no line of communication between you and Allah, your words won't even reach Allah. What is your line of communication between you and Allah? It is your salah. Your five daily prayers opens the pathway between you and Allah. Once you maintain your five daily prayers and you take it seriously, just like how you take your job seriously, correct? Every day I'm up at the same time, I'm not one minute late, and I'm there for the eight hours, you take your salah seriously, then the pathway will be clear for your dua to reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You see, sometimes what happens to us when our phones are dead, when you see that there is no service, there is no Wi-Fi, there's no reception. You see how crazy we become when you cannot talk and communicate to others? But why is it we are fine? when we are not able to communicate to our Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When there is no line of communication between me and Allah. When I don't pray, my spirit says out of service. My spirit says there is no reception. You can't talk to Allah. Because your connectivity to Allah, your connection to Allah is your salah. So the Prophet tells Fatima, Ya Fatima, you want Allah to answer your dua? Then make sure that you take your salah seriously because then the pathway will be clear. This is number two. The second thing that Rasulullah teaches Fatima. Number three, Rasulullah tells Fatima, Ya Fatima, the individual that does not pray, does not take their salah seriously, Allah will not accept their other a'mal. Allah Azza wa Jal will not accept other a'mal. And this is reported in many ahadith that the Prophet says, As-salatu amudu deen. Your salah is the pillar of your faith. If there is no pillar, nothing can contain, nothing can hold your faith. Meaning, I do so many good things in my life. I help my parents, I help other individuals, I come to these lectures, I donate, I go to Hajj, I go to Ziyarah, I do community service. The Prophet tells Fatima, if you do not maintain your salah, Allah will not credit you for your other a'mal. Do you know how awful I will feel on the Day of Judgment? Seeing I did so much, 
It was just salah that I was not serious with. And we said, just take 17 minutes. That I was denied being credited of my a'mal because I was too lazy to pray my 17 rak'ahs. Wallahi, brothers and sisters, it is not worth it for me to be denied being credited for my other good deeds because Allah says you didn't pray. I will not credit you for anything else. So, you know, as we say, it's the cherry on top. You've done everything. Just pray those 17 rak'ahs and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make all your other a'mal count. This is number three that Rasulullah tells her. And number four, the Prophet tells Fatima, the individual that does not take their salah seriously, Allah will take the nur from their face. See ma as-salihin, the Prophet says. Allah will strip that individual the nur in their face. You know some individuals, you see them, their face has so much nur. It emanates, it glows. These individuals are the ones that perfect their salah. These individuals that as soon as they hear the adhan, they will leave whatever they are doing. And they will rush to their master, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you take your salah seriously, Allah azza wa jal gives you a nur in your face. It's a beautiful nur that cannot be described but can only be experienced. This is what Rasulullah tells Fatima. And that's why Fatima alayhi salam, they say when she used to stand before Allah and pray, her face would glow. Al Imam al Sadiq says this. He was asked one day, Al Imam al Sadiq was asked, Why is Fatima alayhi salam called Al Zahra? You know, one of the names of Fatima is Al Zahra. Correct? Zahra. We also use this name. We have many Zahras in our community. What does Zahra mean? The Imam said, the Zahra, by the way, means the one that glows, radiates, emanates, emits. And Imam al-Sadiq says, the reason why she was called as Zahra is because when she would stand to pray to Allah, her face would glow and emanate such that the people of Medina would notice it. Allahu Akbar, the more your salah is complete, the more there is sincerity in your salat and God consciousness, the more Allah will give you that nur in your face. So the Imam al-Sadiq tells his companion, she was named as Zahra because when she used to stand before Allah and prostrate and do sujood and ruku', her face would emanate. So they called her, this is the Zahra, the one that glows, the one that the nur comes from her face. So Rasulullah tells Fatima alayhi salam of the benefits of salah and Fatima alayhi salam is learning and this is a lesson to all of us. Take your salah seriously, brothers and sisters. And when you have children, teach them the importance of salah at a young age. So in the midst of all the challenges that I spoke about, the non-religiosity, the immorality, our children can seek inspiration from Allah through their salah. This is the first lesson that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam taught Fatima. Sallu ala Muhammad wa alihi A second salawat for the love of Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam. The second lesson that Rasulullah teaches Fatima alayhi salam is that he teaches her how to be comforted anytime she has difficulties, anxiety, or stress in life. And this is something we can all benefit from. Listen to the story. The hadith says Fatima comes to Rasulullah one day. She tells him, Ya Rasulullah, I am overburdened at my house. I am overburdened. I am stressed with the housework and the children and everything. It's too much. Ya Rasulullah, this is a difficult time for me. Please help me. So she comes to Rasulullah to seek some guidance, to seek some help because she is overburdened in her house. And this is something that I hear is happening also today, especially with mothers, working mothers. There's just too much that they have to deal with. From one side, you find that she works so the job has certain demands and requirements. From the other side, the husband has demands and requirements. From another side, the children have their own demands. They have their own expectations. And then there are social expectations and commitments. I have to attend this funeral. And I have to attend this wedding. And I have to go and visit this individual. So there are just so many things that this mother has to deal with in the society. And all of this in the middle of a pandemic. Correct? 
every day you turn on the news and it's always negative news. We had 100,000 cases today, half a million, and the other day, 1 million cases. We're all going to die. This world is going to end. There's nothing good in the news today. That's why my advice to you, brothers and sisters, turn off that TV, de delete that app, the news app. Wallahi, your mental health will become so much better because it's all negative, negative, pessimistic. If you become a pessimistic person that thinks the world will end, some people, they come and ask me, say, do you think Imam Mahdi is going to rise next year? The world is end. When you watch CNN the whole day, this is what you think, that this is the end of the world. They don't know that 100 years ago, 500, there were so many things, so many challenges that were much greater. It just depends on your attitude and mentality. So just turn it off and delete that app. So these mothers, they face all of this, all these problems and this, leaves a toll it takes a toll it has a toll on their mental health it really does you see this pandemic they say that it had such a terrible effect on people's mental health because social distancing and wear the mask and school gets canceled and this gets canceled and we have to stay home it's a challenge so rasulullah teaches fatima alayhi salam he gives her a beautiful remedy when she comes and she complains to him, Ya Rasulullah, I'm stressed out. What do I do? Listen, this is a lesson for us, Mu'mineen and Mu'minat. The Prophet tells her, Ya Fatima, let me teach you a dhikr of Allah Azza wa Jal. Anytime you have anxiety, you have a difficult day, you have stress, let me teach you a dhikr of Allah Azza wa Jal. This dhikr will alleviate your stress. This dhikr will bring you relief from the problems that you have. And this is the famous Tasbihatul Zahra alayhi salam. The Prophet tells her in the morning, in the morning, if you have a difficult day, next day in the morning, or you know this is going to be a tough day, then you recite 34 times. It's so easy. It takes two, two minutes. 34 times say Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. 33 times say Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. And 33 times say Subhanallah, Subhanallah. All together collectively 100 times you remember Allah. And remember that when we say dhikr of Allah, don't just allow Allah to be present on your tongue. Some people they're saying these dhikrs but their heart is disconnected, it's somewhere else. When we say dhikr of Allah, that means allow Allah to be present in your heart also. If you allow Allah to be present in your heart, not just on your tongue, the Prophet says that all your stress and all the anxiety and difficulties will begin to ease. How? The idea that the Prophet is teaching Fatima is this. That many times when we have a problem, we just want Allah to take us out of the problem, right? You may say, what is some dhikr? How is that going to solve my financial problem? How is that going to solve my sickness. How is that going to solve my marriage problems? Correct? Some dhikr. The idea that the Prophet is teaching Fatima is that when you have a problem, instead of asking Allah to take you out of the problem, invite Allah into your problem. See how you change your perspective? Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instead of changing the circumstances, ask Allah to change you. Ask Allah to make you stronger. Ask Allah to make you resilient. Because if Allah, every time I have a problem, Allah wants to come and save me, then I won't grow. I'll be a weak individual. I'll be a weak individual that is prone to any, any difficulty in life. It will break me. So when Allah Azza wa Jal allows you to face some difficulties, this allows me to reach my potential. So invite Allah into your life. Instead of telling Allah, Ya Allah, get rid of my financial problem. Ya Allah, get rid of my sickness. Get rid of my anxiety and stress. I ask you, Ya Allah, to come into my life. And I ask you to make me grow from the inside. This is a much better way for me as an individual to grow, my friends. See how Rasulullah is teaching this to Fatima? If you have Allah on your mind and you know He loves you and He's always there for you, this is what you need, the strength and the resilience to face the greatest problem. Because Allah can't come every couple of days and save you from your problems. Every day there's going to be a problem in our life, brothers and sisters. What you need is to be strong. What you need is resilience. What you need is what? 
patience. If Allah gives you all the money in the world, but you're sick, well, you have cancer. What's that money going to do for you? Nothing. Correct? You're still going to have to go and get that tr annoying treatment, that difficult chemotherapy and surgery and go to the doctor every week. Wallahi, some people, such a difficult life. May Allah protect us all from these viruses and diseases. But if Allah Azza wa Jal gives you patience, this is all you need. If I have a problem in my life, ask Allah for patience. Because when Allah gives you patience, then it will be so much easier for you to navigate the difficulties of, of life. And Allah mentions this in the Holy Quran. Allah says, Allah says, beware of human beings, that I will try you in this life. This life is a place of struggle so that we grow. Because if there is no struggle, you don't grow, correct? Just like when you go to the gym, you have to struggle. You have to put an effort. You have to exert force on your muscles. This is how your muscles grow, correct? Physically, you grow through these difficulties. Likewise, spiritually, when there is a struggle in your life, this allows your spirit to grow. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that you will struggle in the dunya. And I made this on purpose so that you grow, you become better. Allah says, وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُوعِ وَنَقْصٍ مِنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنفُسِ وَالثَّمَرَاتِ Allah says, beware of human beings. There will be difficult days in your life. I will try you through fear. The virus, what did it do to us? Many people said, what happened with this pandemic? What happened to Allah? Is He angry with us? No, brothers and sisters. This is the system of Allah that He tells us about in the Qur'an. He says, I will try you with fear. So if you see fear, that means the system of Allah is working. He never said anywhere in the Quran, life is going to always be comfortable. Such that if there's a pandemic, we say, what's going on? No. Allah said, there will be fear. Allah says, I will try you with fear. I will try you with hunger. I will try you with loss of life, loss of wealth, loss of relatives. So when you see that happening around you, you say, Alhamdulillah, the plan of Allah that He promised is working. It shouldn't make you turn away from Allah. It should make you believe in Allah more. So after Allah saying that there are difficulties in life, and then Allah tells you what you need to face those difficulties. You need money? No. If you lose your child, if I have a son or daughter that I love, and I lose them at a young age, all the wallahi, all the money of the world will not help you. I know an individual who lost his daughter. She was 16, 17. He lost her in a tragic way. This father, brothers and sisters, a very wealthy man. A very wealthy man. Owns much more than you think. But when he lost his daughter, the taste of everything that he had and the joy was completely lost. He did not want to live anymore. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you billions and you lose a loved one, that's it. You don't enjoy it anymore. Allah azza wa jal gave him something that was greater than all of his wealth. And that was patience. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought down patience and tranquility upon his heart. And that's how he was able to continue. So Allah says that I will try you and you only need one thing. Continue the verse. And then Allah says, And give glad tidings to the sabirin, the patient ones. The ones when they see affliction in their life, when they're tried, when there's difficulties, they complain and they say, why? No. They say, inna lillah, to Allah we belong and to Him we shall return. Allah Azza wa Jal says, the patient ones will be fine. They will be saved. And then the next verse says, ulaika alayhim salawatum min rabbihim wa rahmah. Those individuals, Allah will send His rahmah and His blessings upon them. So Rasulullah teaches Fatima alayhi salam, there might be difficult days. I can save you with this difficulty and I can bring a fix. But let me give you something that is much better than a temporary fix. And that is to invite Allah into your life. Because when Allah is involved in your problem in your life, then it becomes much easier to handle and endure the difficulties of life. So this is a second beautiful lesson. That Rasulullah teaches his daughter Fatima. And it's a lesson to us. If there is stress, anxiety, difficulties. Every day when you wake up, brothers and sisters, do tasbihat al-zahra. 
And don't let, let it just be words, lip service on my mouth. Feel the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is with you. Allah will take care of you. It might be difficult, but in the end, I will be the one who is victorious and successful. Do Tasbihat al-Zahra. Our Imams tell us that Tasbihat al-Zahra is also should be done after your Salah. Remember the Salah, the five daily prayers? Do Tasbihat al-Zahra. For the Imam says that it is greater to do Tasbihat al-Zahra than to pray 1,000 rak'ahs. 1,000 rak'ahs. How long does that take, brothers and sisters? Laylatul Qadr. Some people. Pray 100 rak'ahs. You see how difficult it is? It takes two, three hours, and then for an entire week I have back pain. The Imam says 1,000 rak'ahs versus tasbihat al-zahra. It takes you two minutes. This is greater than 1,000 rak'ahs. So make this a habit in your life. And finally, the last lesson that we can, there's many lessons, but this is the one, the last one I will mention. The last lesson that Rasulullah teaches Fatima is how to be content in life. Fatima alayhi salam comes to Ima, comes to Rasulullah one day and she's upset. Rasulullah tells her, Ya Fatima, what are you upset about? She tells him, because I overheard some woman speaking against Imam Ali. And they were saying that poor Fatima, her father married her to a poor man. Imam Ali was not a wealthy rich man. Imam Ali did not own much. In fact, when he came to propose to Fatima, the Prophet asked him, what do you have as a mahar, as a dowry? He didn't own anything. He did not even own a house. He told him, Ya Rasulullah, I only own three, I only own three things from the ruins of this dunya. I own my sword, my shield, and a small camel that I use to work with. That's the only thing I own. And this is where Rasulullah said, you need your, shield, uh, you need your sword, you need your camel, but you can live without your shield. He sold his shield and that was the mahar of Sayyida to Nisa al Alameen, brothers and sisters. She had the most humble wedding. Go to our weddings today. How much do we spend on our weddings, brothers and sisters? How much do we spend? And someone was telling me the average wedding here in Dearborn, people spend $100,000. Why? Don't just look at the bride and groom. There's 500 people. How much does each attendee spend? Every lady has to go and get her makeup done, right? How much does that cost? $50, $100, $150, I don't know. Right? You have to buy a dress. He was telling me you can't wear the same dress twice. I wore this dress last month. I can't wear it again, correct? And the dress, how much does that cost? $200, $300, $500, $1,000, go up. You have to buy new shoes for the men. They have to buy a new tuxedo. They have to buy a new, um, they have to also buy, you know, new clothing, the perfume, the makeup, this, that, the food that is brought. And unfortunately, some of the weddings in our communities, they bring the singer, correct? They bring the singer and they pay him thousands of dollars. And then when there's a problem, a couple of months, they come to us. Say it, please help us in our marriage. Your entire marriage was built upon sin, upon haram. You want Allah to give you a beautiful marriage? And then when you have a problem, you come, I don't have miracles, brothers and sisters. But there are things, preventive measure, measures that we can do before these problems happen. What do we base our marriages on, brothers and sisters? It's all money, materialism. For men, it's the looks. For Sometimes, even now, we can't generalize, but many times for you know, the father, the mother, when they want the, the son-in-law, it's how much money does he have in his bank account, correct? What's his career? It's all about dunya. It's all about materialism. And you know what the problem is? This does not ensure happiness. I wish it brought happiness to the girl and to the guy. It does not. There was a study I read in Emory University. When I say the Quran says, people don't buy it. But when I say university says, yes, no, this is scientific. Emory University, they did a study. The study showed that the woman who prioritized when they chose their husband, who prioritized wealth, wealth was important, meaning the financial status of their husband was a big deal for them. I'm not saying this is not important. It's important. Don't go and get married to a homeless individual. But some people, they make it the biggest deal. This is the only important thing. This study was saying, 
that for women that made the financial status of their husband the priority, they were 60% more likely to get in a divorce than women who did not care too much about the financial aspect. 60%. By focusing on the materialism, there is a 60% chance, higher chance, that my relationship will end in divorce. And for the men, it said, for men who focus on just the looks, 50% chance, higher chance, that they would end up in a divorce. Fatima comes to Rasulullah. She's upset because she's hearing this, that Imam Ali is poor. Rasulullah tells her, Ya Fatima, Ali may be poor in the dunya. But Ali has something that no individual on earth possess. And that is his personality, his character, his iman. Ali fears Allah Azza wa Jal. Ali is someone I can trust. You are my, you are my, you know, my soul, O Fatima. I can trust you in the hands of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Why? Because Ali fears Allah Azza wa Jal. I know he will never hurt you. I know he will never abuse you. Because he fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What's the point? of having a millionaire husband if he comes drunk at night and he doesn't know what he's doing. What's the point? What will that money do for my daughter? This is for the parents. They just want, as long as he's wealthy, alhamdulillah, my daughter will be happy. No. If there is no iman, no piety, fear of Allah, what will all the money of the world do if he does not fear Allah and he comes drunk at night? When I say these, that means there are stories of this in our own communities. What's the point of having all the money of the world if the husband abuses the wife, either verbally and physically, because he does not fear Allah. The one who abuses his wife does not fear Allah Azza wa Jal. You don't like her? You don't, you don't love her? Divorce her. Why do you abuse her? It is haram, the Quran says, if you don't like your wife, divorce her. You have no right to keep her and abuse her. Either live with her with kindness. You don't like her. There are problems. Get a divorce. But no, to keep her and to abuse her. And to physically or verbally abuse her and oppress her, the Quran says this is haram. So Rasulullah tells her, Ya Fatima, Imam Ali has something that money can never buy. And that is what? Taqwa, piety, fear of Allah Azza wa Jal. Brothers and sisters, when you look for the spouse, I know the money is important. I know the looks are important. But there is something that is much more important than this. This will give you long lasting happiness in the in the long term and that is piety and that is faith akhlaq when you focus on this allah azza wa jal will ensure that you have a beautiful life and subhanallah the same the same study that i cited emory university found that the more you spend they found this trend the more couples spend on their wedding the higher the chances of divorce was couples that spend that splurge on their wedding on the ring the wedding ring they had a higher chance of getting divorced. And I said, look at our communities, how much we spend. All of this is getting ruined. Even if it's halal, materialism does not help us. It does not buy happiness. We say this over and over again, but unfortunately, nobody listens. So Rasulullah tells her, Ya Fatima, money will not make you happy. It is piety, taqwa, the personality of your husband, Ali ibn Abi Talib, that will make you happy. Imagine if we were to take these lessons and apply it in our lives. Wallahi, you know, every week we have tons of calls in our community, people that want marriage counseling, people that are on the brinks of divorce. If we were just to follow these simple advice of Rasulullah of Ahlul Bayt, then the rate of divorce, the problems in our communities, the marital problems would be much, much less. And this is what Imam Ali alayhi salam himself said. After Fatima alayhi salam died, you know what Imam Ali said? He spoke about how he used to treat Fatima alayhi salam. He said this, فَوَاللَّهِ مَا أَغْضَبْتُهَا وَلَا أَكْرَهْتُهَا عَلَىٰ أَمْرٍ حَتَّى قَبَضَهَا اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ He says, وَاللَّهِ I, He's swearing by the might of Allah. This is Imam Ali, you know he's not exaggerating. He says, Wallahi ma aghdabtuha. I never angered Fatima even once in my life. You think money can buy this? Where do you find such a husband? He says, I never angered her. I never upset her even once in my life. I never forced her to do anything until the day that Allah Azzawajal took her. Until the day that she died. And then likewise he said, Wala aghdabatni. Wala asat li amra. And then he says, and I 
Likewise, she never upset me, right? I never upset her and she never upset me. She never upset me. She never resisted anything I told her. Even if I asked something polite, she never told me no. She never made me upset. Where do you find such a beautiful relationship, brothers and sisters? Money you think could buy this, the looks can buy this? Wallahi, they cannot. Allah tells us this in the Quran. The Prophet tells us this. Imam Ali tells us this. And then even new study tells us this. And this is the most beautiful part of what Imam Ali says about his wife Fatima. He says, وَلَقَدْ كُنْتُ أَنظُرُ إِلَيْهَا فَتَنْكَشِفْ عَنِّي الْهُمُومُ وَالْأَحْزَانِ He says, when I used to look at Fatima alayha salam, any time I used to have stress, I used to have a difficult day, I would look at the face of Fatima and I would forget about all my stress and agony. Allahu Akbar. How many men are privileged with having such a wife? That when I have a difficult day, I come home and I see my wife and I forget all about my stress. I forget all my agony. Spend millions of dollars on your wedding. Spend millions of dollars on your marriage. Wallahi, you can never buy this beautiful feeling that Imam Ali alayhi salam had. Only taqwa and piety, righteousness and God consciousness can bring to us. Anytime I used to go to my house, I would look at Fatima, just the look, and I would forget about all my stress. Subhanallah. This was the stress reliever for Amir al muminin alayhi salam. These are the beautiful lessons that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam taught Fatima. And that's why when Imam Ali lost Fatima, he was so heartbroken. He could never forget the beautiful days that he was with Fatima. Because Fatima was truly an angel in her character in her demeanor, in her akhlaq, where could Imam Ali ever find someone like Fatima to Zahra alayhi salatu wassalam? That's why when he lost Fatima, he was in so much pain. After he buried Fatima, and Fatima was buried all alone. Not too many people participated in the burial of Fatima. It was done at night. Only a few of the loyal companions of Imam Ali alayhi salam attended the burial of Fatima. Imam Hassan and Hussein, they were young, they attended Asma and Fidda. They were the servants of Imam Ali alayhi salam who helped in the house. house. They attended, they attended the, burial the burial of Fatima, of Fatima alayhi salam. Alayhi salam. After, After Imam Ali, Ali buried Fatima, he stood on her grave and he was filled with so much, with so much agony. His heart was bleeding over Fatima that he lost her at such a young age. She was only 18 when he lost her. He was, she was only 18 when Imam Ali alayhi salam was deprived of her. So Amir al muminin stood on her grave and he read two lines of poetry. Wallahi, these two lines, they break the heart. It shows you the condition of Imam Ali, how much he was in pain. He stood on the grave of Fatima and he said these two lines of poetry. He said, لكل اجتماع من خليلين فرقة وكل الذي دون الممات قليل He said every relationship, every friendship between two individuals, a day will come in which this relationship will end. A day will come in which they will be separated. And as long as the Imam says, as long as you are still surrounded by your loved ones, as long as you have your loved ones around you, then you have seen nothing yet. Then thank Allah Azza wa Jal because you do not know when your loved ones will be taken from you. And then he said, He says, and the fact that I lost my beloved Rasulullah only a few days ago, and right after that I lost my beloved Fatima. Within, uh, within 60, 60 or 90, or 90 days, days was, was Amir al muminin lost, lost two of the greatest, greatest individuals, individuals in his life. In his life. He, he lost, lost Rasulullah and then he lost Fatima. Fatima.
He says that the fact that I lost Rasulullah and Fatima within such a short period is the greatest testimony that this life is so worthless. As long as Allah has given you this ni'mah of being surrounded by loved ones, then don't take this for granted. Thank Allah Azza wa Jal and enjoy this ni'mah. And Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he is young, he narrates this. He says, After my father, Father Amir al Mu'mineen buried my mother Fatima. I saw his tears began to fall down on his cheek. He turned towards the grave of Rasulullah and he began to speak to Rasulullah. He said, Assalamu alayka ya Rasulullah, anni wa an safiyatik, wa za'iratik, wa al-ba'itati fi al-tharab buq'atik. He says, Ya Rasulullah, salam from me and salam from your daughter Fatima that I have just buried. That now you are united with her. That now has joined you. And then he spoke about his condition. He told him, Ya Rasulullah, Amma huzni fasarmadu wa amma layli famusahadu. Ya Rasulullah, as for my nights, they will always be sleepless after losing Fatima. As for my agony and pain, it will be endless, it will be eternal, Ya Rasulullah. I ask you, Ya Rasulullah, when you see Fatima, ask her to tell you what they did to her, all of the oppression, all of the injustice that she saw. Ask her because she never complained to me. She never told me, Ya Ali, they did this to me, they did that to me. So I ask you, Ya Rasulullah, to ask her so that she can can tell you and complain to you. They say Imam Ali alayhi salam in the midst of doing the ziyara of Rasulullah. He slept on, he took a nap besides the grave of Fatima alayhi salam. He saw in his dream Fatima telling him, Ya Ali, thank you for coming and burying me. But now I ask you to go back to the house. Imam Ali tells her, Ya Fatima, why? You told me in your will that you want me to come and sit beside your qabr, beside your grave and to recite Quran. Do you not want me to sit and recite Quran? Fatima tells him, Ya Ali, Yes, I want you to recite Quran, but now you have to go back to the house. Why, O oh Fatima? She tells him, because Zainab, our dear daughter Zainab, has awakened in the middle of the night. She does not find her mother Fatima nor her father Ali, and she is crying lonely. Imam Ali goes back to the house. He sees Zainab is crying in a corner. My dear father, I woke up. I am Fatima, my, my mother is mother not is there. there. And Amir al Mu'mineen, you were not there, my dear father, all alone. Just this one word and I will end. I say, Ya Zahra, Ya Ali, you could not bear to see Zainab alone, even though Hassan and Hussein were with her in the house and she was saved. Then what happened to you, O oh Fatima, on the day of Ashura? When Hassan was not there, when Hussein was not there, rather Zainab was all alone between the enemies and she received no comfort. In fact, all of a sudden she sees Shimmer behind him and he is whipping her with his lash. <laughs> آل محمد أيام قلب ينقلبون والعاقبة للمتقين Brothers and sisters, let us raise our hands and supplicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala together. Ya Allah, everyone together. Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Allah. 
يا الله يا الله يا الله يا الله يا الله we ask you to accept our أعمال to grant us our حاجات to forgive us of our sins anyone that has a حاجة يا الله grant them their حاجات anyone that is sick يا الله we ask you to grant them full شفاء and recovery hasten the reappearance of the مولا صاحب العصر والزمان make us amongst his companions and supporters enable us to follow in the footsteps of Ahlul Bayt to learn the teachings learn from the teachings of Ahlul Bayt عليهم السلام grant us in the dunya the ziyara of Ahlul Bayt and in the akhira the shafa of Ahlul Bayt and let us end by reciting Surah Al-Fatiha for all the mu'mineen and mu'minat that have departed us after a long salawat for Muhammad and Al Muhammad Fatima O oh, the soul between Rasul Allah sides Fatima O oh, the fragrance last in Ali's mind Fatima, O oh, the flower that left and decorated the skies. Fatima, for until today we hear the Mahdi's cries. For until today we hear. The Mahdi's cries, searching for her grave light, searching for a star. No matter how close she still remains far. Searching for her grave light, searching for a star. No matter how close she still remains far. Buried with her secrets and heavenly sense. Buried with, with her, her secrets and heavenly sense, O oh, Mahdi, rise for it's time to lament. O oh, Mahdi, rise for it's time to lament. Searching for her grave like searching for a star, no matter how close she still remains far. Buried with her secrets and heavenly sense, buried with, with her, her secrets and heavenly scent, O oh, Mahdi, rise for it's time, it. time to lament. O oh, Mahdi, oh, Mahdi, rise for it. it. When they when brought, they brought their, their logs to, to burn her house, house they called, Oh, Fatima, bring, bring your spouse. spouse. They called, they Oh, Fatima, bring your, your spouse. spouse. She, replied she replied behind, behind the door, which was shut. shut. They, said, they said, It's Fatima, and he said, So what? They said, It's Fatima, and he said, So what? He kicked with with his, his foot, foot and, and hit her and with the door. the door. She ended, she ended up falling like a star, like a star on the floor. The floor. She, she lied with, with no help as she sat and, and bled. Even, Even the sky's tears began to shed. Where are you, O oh, Savior, from her descent? Where are you, O oh, Savior, from her descent? O oh, Mahdi, rise for it. Time to lament. O Mahdi, rise for it. Time to lament. All together, searching for her grave, like searching for a star. No matter how close she still remains far. Searching for her grave, like searching for a star. No matter how close she still remains far. Buried with her secrets and heaven. 
heavenly sent, buried with her secret sense, heavenly sent. O Mehdi, rise for it, time to lament. O Mehdi, rise for it, time to lament. Her Muhsin, he caused her to miscarry. She would tell him, leave my dear, go hurry. She would tell him, leave my dear, go hurry. For the sight of me will break your heart. I'd rather you go than being torn apart. She would weep over his empty crib. She would weep over his empty crib. A mother left broken like her rib. A mother left broken like her rib. She would call out to Fiva for some aid. The skies would darken because of their rate. The skies would darken because of their rate. She would ask for her beloved Ali. Even towards him, they displayed no mercy. For their actions, they would never repent. For their actions, they would never repent. O oh, Mahdi, rise for it. It's time to lament. O oh, Mahdi, rise for it. It's time to lament. Searching for her grave like searching for a star. No matter how close she still remains far. Altogether, searching for her grave like. No matter how close. Son. Buried with her secret sense, heavenly sense. Buried with her secret sense, heavenly sense. O Mahdi, rise for it. Time to lament. O Mahdi, rise for it. Not too long after the real tragedy befell her children having to bid her farewell. As Zainab's heart shattered with no mother to mend, checking if she's gone or it's just pretend, hoping it's just one bad dream. The tears from her eyes began to stream. Oh, Hussein, come and see our mother. Oh, Hussein, come and see our mother. Hassan called out to his dear brother. The angels gathered for such a sight. The angels gathered for such a sight. The world turned forever into night. When her soul departed and was sent. When her soul departed and was sent. O Mahdi, rise for it. It's time to lament. O Mahdi, rise for it. It's time to lament. Searching for her grave. No matter. Louder. Searching for her. No matter. Buried with her, buried with her secret and heavenly scent. O Mahdi, rise for it, it's time to lament. O Mahdi, rise for it, it's time to lament. Our hearts have broken through the years, as our eyes for you are filled with tears. Every year her tragedy you don't forget, as outside her door you go and sit. As outside her door you go and sit With your hands raised you ask and pray Oh my Lord hasten for me that day Oh my Lord hasten for me that day Your time is coming and none can prevent Your time is coming and none can prevent Oh Mahdi rise for it's time to lament 
lament. O Mahdi, rise, for it's time to lament. Searching for her grave like searching for a star. No matter how close she still remains far. Buried with her secrets and heavenly sand. Buried with her secrets and heavenly sand. O Mahdi, rise, for it's time to lament. O Mahdi. Rise for its time to lament. Aflaha man salla ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Adham Allah wajurana wajurukum jami'an on this sad occasion of the death anniversary of Sayyidatun Nisa al-Alameen. Insha'Allah, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to be among those who she intercedes for on the Day of Judgment. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant relief to all those who are oppressed, to cure all those who are ill, to hasten in their appearance of our beloved Master and Imam Sahib al-Asri wa Zaman. And for that, we recite Surah Al-Mubarakatul Fatiha, but before it, the loudest of your salawat. <laughs> 